week we uh, looked at a mighty warrior, a spiritual warrior in King David's life from his older years. We're going to rewind today. And uh, David had killed Goliath. And for several years, he served King Saul in multiple ways right there in the palace. And finally, he had to leave the palace. He had to leave the palace by cover of night and stealth because Saul, King Saul, had become very jealous of him and now considered David the enemy and uh, tried to kill him on several occasions and then tried to have others kill him on several occasions. But thankfully, God took care of him and uh, kept him safe. So now David has moved out into the desert and over a period of time, uh, people start coming and joining his band. And he ends up with a small army and they are fiercely devoted to him. One of those mighty men of David's was named Abishai. And Abishai was David's nephew, and he was one of the bravest, but he was also one of the most impulsive of David's, what the Bible calls his 30 mighty men. He was a daring warrior. He was an effective commander, and he was utterly loyal to David. Today, we're going to look at a characteristic of David that is connected to Abishai. Now, today, there's no way to do this except to read the story of David and Abishai. And so I'm going to do that, but it's kind of long, so I won't make you stand up. I'll be kind this morning. But if you'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 26, if you have your Bibles and would like to, I'll be reading from a translation called the New Living Translation. Now some men from Ziph came to Saul at Geba to tell him, David is hiding on the hill of Hakiah, which overlooks Jezebel. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's elite troops and went to hunt him down in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul camped along the road beside the hill of Hekalah near Jeshimon, where David was hiding. When David learned that Saul had come after him into the wilderness, he sent out spies to verify the report of Saul's arrival. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside a ring formed by slumbering warriors. Who will volunteer to go there with me? David asked Amalek, the Hittite, and Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, replied Abishai. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God, hey, psst. David, I'm sure that's really just got missed in the scripture. Psst, psst, listen to me. God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time. Abishai whispered to David. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. No, David said. Don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord, the Lord will strike Saul down someday or he will die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed, but take his spear and that jug of water beside his head and let's get out of here. So David took the spear and jug of water that were near Saul's head. And he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. David climbed the hill. I love this. This is trash talking at its best. 
David climbed the hill opposite the camp until he was at a safe distance. Then he shouted down at the soldiers and to Abner, son of Ner. Wake up, Abner! Who is it? Abner demanded. Well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all Israel is there anyone as mighty? So... Why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around. Where are the king's spear and the jug of water that were beside his head? Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Saul recognized David's voice and called out, Is that you? My son, David. And David replied, Yes, my lord, the king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? But now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then may those involved be cursed by the Lord. For they have driven me from my home so I can no longer live among the Lord's people. And they have said, go worship pagan gods. Must I die on foreign soil far from the presence of the Lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single flea? Why does he hunt me down like a partridge in the mountains? Then Saul confessed. I have sinned. Come back home, my son, and I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very wrong. Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you, even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, Blessings on you, my son David. You will do many heroic deeds and you will surely succeed. Then David went away and Saul returned home. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Saul has come to the desert of Ziph to kill David. He brings 3,000 troops. He totally intends to wipe them all out. When David's spies discover Saul's with them and his exact location, Abishai volunteers to accompany David into Saul's camp under cover of darkness. They find Saul and his men in a deep sleep that the scripture indicates was God's doing. Saul's spear is stuck in the ground behind, beside him and his soldiers, along with General Abner, are lying all around him, snoring away. That would cover up any sound anybody made if it was my husband, Jay. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Last week, Jimmy, our little six-year-old grandson, Jay's in there sleeping and Jimmy comes and I'm in the kitchen and he comes in there and he says, Grandma, is something wrong with Grandpa? <laughs> no, Jimmy, Grandpa's fine. <laughs> but I can't talk. According to Jay, I can't talk. <laughs> Abishai sums up the situation. He looks around. He sees that the Lord has truly delivered Saul into their hands. I mean, seriously, if Saul is killed, the chase ends. They get to go home. If Saul is killed, more than likely David will ascend to the throne and quickly. Regular, logical thinking would say, here's your chance, take it. This is one of those places where we see that open doors don't always mean we're to walk through them. Sometimes 
being close enough to God for his heart to beat into us gives us wisdom and direction for the right timing. Abishai wants to pin Saul to the ground with the spear. And David steps up and shows an incredibly important attribute of a great warrior. Because you realize King David was a great warrior. He refuses to kill. He refuses to kidnap. He refuses to hurt the man who the Lord once anointed and chose as leader of the kingdom. Remember, this is a man who has attempted to murder David several times. He has chased David and his followers mercilessly. The loyal warriors of David have been on the run from one dusty foxhole to another. Here is David's chance to kill this man who has actually turned away from God, stopped leading Israel, and he's become obsessed with killing David. But as David stands over King Saul, something wells up from deep within him, something that none of us can explain. It's a character trait given by God himself. It's the trait of compassion. It's the trait of utter trust in God's timing and how God wants things to be done. David shows mercy. He even shows grace here because Saul does not deserve to be spared. I mean, read the story. Saul was a bad guy. He had on a black hat all the time. Some of you are old enough to know what I'm talking about there. (laughs) He has been a faithless friend to David. He has been a tyrant. Saul has treated his own family members as commodities. He has run his army ragged in the pursuit of David rather than the Philistine enemies, which, by the way, are still at war with Israel. What in the world is Saul doing with 3,000 warriors chasing David when over here is the Philistines that they're at war with? But David, who is fully committed to God, who is at this point absolutely following God's leading, shows this trait of compassion. Saul doesn't deserve it. Saul's life has become a mess. You ever seen that before, Brother Lou? You see, it's not our place to judge. And it's not our place sometimes even to take matters in our own hands and take care of the problem. As followers of Jesus Christ, it is our place to let the Holy Spirit flow compassion through us. Looking at someone with the eyes of Jesus when they need help and wanting to help them. What was your definition? That was a great definition. Because, you know, even the people on the street corner holding the sign we tend to make an instant judgment. Oh, they could get a job. Maybe they could, but that's not our call. They might deserve to be pinned to the ground. I don't know. Compassion, mercy, grace, they're not just feelings. Oh, we have feelings that contribute to compassion, mercy, and grace. God gives them to us, and they're good for us. But this attribute of compassion that the Holy Spirit gives is when I step back 
and I make a willful decision to allow the compassion of the Lord to be my decision maker. You know, you have to make that decision. You can't base that kind of stuff just on feeling because our feelings can deceive us. Compassion is a decision to put aside grievances, anger, bitterness, and or revenge, and to show mercy. It is a determination not to take advantage of a situation or a person, but to favor someone who probably doesn't deserve it. It is a judgment call to give the other the benefit of the doubt and sometimes give them a second chance. Hand up, not a handout. That's what real godly compassion is. You know, I don't know that we can really do that if we don't get involved somehow in people's lives. Jesus was the greatest spiritual warrior of all and he chose to give himself up to die so that others could be forgiven when he was forsaken. Jesus made a decision to experience death so that his res resurrection would bring life to those who may not deserve it. Jesus made a judgment call to sacrifice his rights to put an end to evil people. You know, he could have just destroyed the world and started all over. You realize that. He chose. He made a judgment call to sacrifice his rights to put an end to evil people who might even be oblivious that they were evil and grant them a second chance. David stood over Saul and gave him a second chance. David could have ended the wars that were ahead. David could have done all of that. But the compassion of the Lord welled up within him. And he chose to be compassionate to Saul. Even today, Jesus is still pouring out grace, mercy, and compassion. It's available to any and all. Maybe even especially to those who are antagonistic, defiant, or even dangerous sometimes. Jesus is still standing over folks who don't really deserve it and giving grace. You know what grace is, don't you? Compassion, grace, mercy, they're all wrapped up in the same cocoon. God has called us to follow a compassionate king. And if you've never known Jesus Christ, if you've let yourself get away from this compassionate one, ooh, maybe you're here today because he wants to give you a second chance. Could it be? He is ready and willing to offer compassion, mercy, and grace. No matter where you've been, what you are, who you are, or what's happened. I bet you say that to a lot of people, don't you, Lou? And as Christ followers, as Christ followers, we are spiritual warriors. The New Testament talks about us and in, in uses that language. We are part of the kingdom of God. Yes, I know you're part of Chief's kingdom, but you're also over and above that, the kingdom of God. And our Lord is Jesus Christ, and we are to be like Him. We are to make the choice to live out compassion. We are to make the choice to put aside grievances and anger and bitterness and or revenge and show mercy. 
We are to determine in our will, in our hearts, not to take advantage of situations or people, but even favor those who may not deserve it. We are called to resolve to give others the benefit of the doubt and even second chances and sometimes third chances. And so, What did Jesus say, that 40 times 40 thing? It is what soldiers in the army of the Lord do. Abishai wasn't wrong about Saul. You realize that, don't you? But he hadn't learned to trust God's compassionate heart. Abishai was a great soldier. Abishai was a God follower. <coughs> but he hadn't let the compassion of God flow through him. He was all about, I know what's right, and it's right to get rid of this guy. And here's my chance. And David says, Ooh, wait a minute, Abishai. God called him and anointed him, and even though he's in the wrong, it's not our place, it's not our place to judge him. It's not our place to even bestow punishment, you know, that's God's place. Only God's place. This great attribute of compassion in a spiritual soldier begins inside of us, and then it moves to the outside. And we have to say yes to that with God. It's a constant work, believe you me. Compassion in us is a constant work of the Spirit. Because probably, if we're real honest, we're probably not the most compassionate people in the world. It's a whole lot easier to make judgments, uh, do something, and let it, you know, then we're done. It's a whole lot harder to have compassion that's going to cost us. David's compassion cost him cost him years of running from Saul because yeah Saul here Saul sounds like a really good guy here doesn't he no that was part of Saul's problem Saul was extremely two faced but David took the road of compassion and you know what he was right the Lord took Saul out David didn't have to Saul wasn't even fighting against David when he was killed he was fighting against a whole different crew God took care of that and that freed David from blame shame and guilt hmm freed from blame shame and guilt Freed from blame, shame, and guilt. That's what compassion can do for us. And it's what compassion can do for others when we bestow it. Spiritual warrior. Spiritual warrior shows compassion. It's not all about spears and shields and swords. Sometimes it's about being so close to God that God's heart moves in you and through you, in me and through me. Even uh, this morning, we heard stories of how compassion is changing people's lives. It works for us and benefits us. It works for the church and benefits the church. It works for our community and benefits our community. It works for the world and even could change things that we thought were impossible to change. Your young lady you talked about that just got accepted at MU, I bet four years ago she never thought that was possible. Never thought that was possible. And God says, excuse me, you haven't, I haven't gone on vacation and put you on the throne. So stop thinking that way. Let me... 
put myself into you. Let me come out of you in every way. As Glenda has said many times, and I've heard Kelly say many times, pray until you know God's compassionate heart. Pray until you know what He wants you to do, to be, where to serve, where to give. Let God lead you in this road of compassion. And He will. Believe you me, if you start asking the Lord, Lord, help me with compassion, He's going to do it, so get ready. And if you start asking, Lord, how am I to be compassionate to others? Be ready, because He's going to show you. It may even be in your own family. It could be Hillcrest. He may be calling you to go volunteer or give or help somebody. I'm sure they could use financial counselors or all kinds of things with their program. It could be, oh man, it could be that he's calling you. I just spent time last week with a retired missionary from Romania and got to hear all the updates from that church in that place where they're so poor. We don't know what poor is, folks. <laughs> Even our poor people don't know what poor is compared to other parts of the world. God could be calling you to go to Romania or somewhere. Oh, boy, everybody's eyes got wide then. The reality is, compassion is a part of who God is. Therefore, compassion is a part of who we as His soldiers are. Let us pray.